I want to thank George for being right there on the second row every Sunday with the camera and recording our services. Because when I'm here trying to get my act together, you know well, some Sundays I do, some Sundays I don't. But a lot of times I miss the beauty of what this one over here does. And I get to pick up Wednesday, Thursday, whenever all of a sudden I have an extra 30 minutes to watch what we did on Sunday. And I'll be honest with you, I don't watch me because I know me and I know the mistakes I made when I made them and I don't need to have them put back in front of me. But so frequently I cannot appreciate what she does over there because I'm trying to get ready in my head for the next 20 minutes or 30, George, that's all right, whichever way you want to look at it. <laughs> but I thank George Goodnight for the work that he does and what I hope he gives to you throughout the week. Sometime if you get a chance, yeah, you heard it this morning, go to Tuesday or Wednesday or whenever, whenever it gets up there. Look at it again. It's almost like being in God's house a second time during the week. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you, George. All right, I'll follow up where John left us. First John, chapter 5. I'm reading out of the message, so it'll read a little differently. The message is the same. John says, if we take human testimony at face value, how much more should we be reassured when God gives testimony as he does here, testifying concerning his son? Whoever believes in the Son of God inwardly confirms God's testimony. Whoever refuses to believe in effect calls God a liar. Refusing to believe God's own testimony regarding his Son. This is the testimony in essence. God gave us eternal life. The life is in his Son. And John says, my purpose in writing is simply this, that you who believe in God's Son will know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you have eternal life, the reality, and not the illusion. And how bold and free we then become in His presence, freely asking according to His will, sure that He is listening. This is, friends, God speaking to us. Last week, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I can't tell you exactly when it was, I got this random email that was sent to me and about 500,000 other people from some man I have no idea who it was. And here it goes, this long list of people and his message was that I and all the rest of us should go to a website that he listed and read an essay that he had posted there about abortion at Dunk, Wiggle, and Squire. At one point in his email, he wrote the following words. These are his words. Remember, abortion is not just a political issue. It is very much a religious one. It drives straight to the heart of our beliefs. And he says, I'm going to do everything possible to tell believers about this essay, and I ask for your help also. Now, that's the last you're going to hear about abortion. I am not about to preach a sermon on abortion, so calm down. But I want, to like, I want us to focus on a sentence that's found in this first letter of John, and it's embedded there in the fifth chapter. And in verses 4 and 5, what it says is, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our, your and my, faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Who is it that overcomes wrongdoing? The person who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's who it is. What the author here, 
who was called the elder in one of the other short letters, writes and he affirms the only thing that has the ability to bring victory over evil, to bring, bring victory over wrongdoing, is faith. And that's not just some generic cover-all faith in the goodness of humanity or in the inevitability that life is going to get better, there's going to be social improvement. Rather, this elder writes that this faith is centered one place and one place only, and that is in the person of Jesus Christ. How strange it is that in the course of our lives, we easily, so easily, allow those things which really aren't very important to become the focus of our time, the focus of our emotions, and influence us greatly on how we expend our energy. There's a story that I've used, maybe here, I know I've used it two or three times in different contexts, about a young sailor on board a ship that was sailing out in the ocean. And the captain came up to him as they were up in the pilot house and asked him to take the helm while the captain took a brief nap. Now, it was in the middle of the night, the stars were shining very brightly, and the captain said, all you need to do is follow the North Star. That's it. And he carefully pointed out that star to the young man. And he looked at him and he said, do you think you can do it? Yes, sir, the sailor said proudly. I can do it, you can count on me. And he put his hands on that big wheel, and the captain had faith in him, and he disappeared below to go down to his berth. Several, hour, several hours later, the captain awakened, and he came up to the helm, and glancing up into the sky, he knew that something was terribly wrong. Hey, sailor, what are you doing? Why are we not headed for the North Star? Oh, said the sailor, and he couldn't figure out why the captain was so perplexed. We passed that an hour and a half ago. <laughs> well, the captain knew. The captain knew that the only reliable point in the middle of wind and waves, the only steady point in a world of confusion and emotions and guesswork over direction, currents and relationships was the polar star, the North Star. And when you strayed from that star, you were way off course, period. End of conversation. And that's very much sometimes like life for all of us here in the middle of May in the 21st century. Have you ever noticed, ever noticed that what thrills and confuses, what excites and what mystifies, what inspires and what challenges someone who is new to the Christian faith, it isn't all the traditions and the morals and the commandments, those things that we spend so much time arguing about. It's not the liturgy. It's not the creeds or the lack of creeds. That's not what interests them. What grabs the attention of new Christians is Jesus himself. If you were to come in here in 45 minutes and listen to the two young men, and I don't know which one might be preaching this morning, their messages are so Christ-centric. And I try hard to make mine Christ-centric. Now, I love the Old Testament, but it's Christ that appeals to these young people. And that's what they're looking for, is something that they can focus on. I know that in my life, and I suspect that in yours, it's so easy to get caught up in all sorts of very important matters of life, and church, and theology, and the Bible, 
and all that goes along with church. And I do, for years, have found all of that stimulating. But, and it has a way of consuming me and makes me think maybe I'm do what I'm doing is important. But over the years, I've also noticed that when I focus more on Jesus, my interest turns to all. And stimulation is replaced by inspiration. When I look at Jesus, when I read about Jesus, when I ponder Jesus, I understand so much better what he's done for the world, yeah, but what he's done for me. T.S. Eliot, famous old author, wrote of the search for what he called the still point of the turning world. Think back to when you were in sixth or seventh grade, I don't remember when we learned it, and you would see a globe. And through the center of that globe was a rod. And the bottom of the rod was in the dirt, in, in something made it solid. And the globe turned consistently. It revolved around that rod, but at the bottom was the still point of the turning world. Well, the Old Testament, from the very beginning to the very end, to the very end, affirms that we can have no other center in our lives than God. That's the Old Testament. The, Old, the New Testament picks up, and in the New Testament, all the way to Revelation, we read a witness to the fact that Jesus provides for us the face of God and the way to know God. Now, those who have grown up all of their lives, or the majority of their lives, with Jesus can easily, easily forget that without Him, without Jesus, there would be no, no Christian faith. There would be no center. There would be no peace. We'd still be trying to find a way to get an unpredictable, punitive God off our back via sacrifices and by, by the way of laws. And that is the God of Judaism and the Old Testament. How important it is now for us in New Testament days to remember to focus on our common commitment to God that we know through Jesus Christ rather than on that all-important but secondary group of issues, group of issues that lead us, that the commitment God leads us to grapple with. You know, the issues we face every day in our religious life, war and peace. Abortion, I'm sorry, I did say it again. Homosexuality, welfare, and just a flock of vital issues of our time. If we are going to avoid more wars, then we as Christians have to gently argue about how best to do it. But while we're having that, sim that simple argument, we've got to do one thing, folks. We've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. We've got to go to work. And we've got to work for peace at home. We've got to work for peace at school. We've got to work for peace at play. But all the while we're working, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. We've got to struggle against racism and greed and immorality as we experience them because each one of us experiences those things in our own way. The way we react, it's our own. But no matter how we react, we all have to do one thing in common, and that's to keep our eyes on Jesus. As I studied for this this week, I found a commentary on 1 John, and whoever wrote it, and I should have written his name down, but I didn't, says, 
If Christ occupies the center at which faith comes into focus, 